really excited to be here. This is one of the first times that we're presenting the data from this trial. And this trial took about a decade to complete, and it represented an extraordinary collaboration between the schools of medicine at NYU, UCLA, and Johns Hopkins. And at NYU, um, it represented an improbable collaboration between the NYU School of Medicine and the NYU College of Dentistry. So I can say this is the only psychedelic study that's ever taken place at a dental school. Uh, and the story of that, uh, I won't get into, but it, it says a lot about um, sort of how difficult it was to do the trial, but also how supportive we were uh, at NYU. In terms of disclosures, I received my research funding from NIDA, Hefter Research Institute, and the NYU School of Medicine. So the history of using psychedelics to help the dying, the indigenous cultures have used it uh, for millennia, but the first attempt to think about it in Western culture, Gordon Wasson was a banker here in New York, and he rediscovered uh, psilocybin mushrooms in the 50s in Mexico, and he brought it back to the US, and his wife, Valentina Wasson, was a pediatrician. She was the first physician to ever suggest that psychedelics could be used to help the dying. And of course, we have Aldous Huxley here. He believed in this so much, he used LSD on his deathbed. In American medicine in the 50s, this guy, Eric Kass, was an internist and a psychiatrist at the University of Chicago. And he gave LSD, not knowing anything about preparation or anything, he would just sort of drop a dose in the morning on their tongues and come back at the end of the day. And he uh, improbably did this hundreds of times. He was looking for an anti-pain effect, and what he found was decreased fear of death, decreased depression, and decreased uh, anxiety, uh, and, but this was mostly all open label work. Uh, this is Stan Groff and, and Walter Pankey here, and this was the sort of psychedelic dream team at Spring Grove, and they started to give LSD assisted psychotherapy to dying cancer patients, and pre and post they found an effect, but uh, before they could go to controlled trials, uh, Richard Nixon declared war on drugs and Timothy Leary and the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 was enacted and all the research stopped. In the modern era, we have picked up this research again, Charlie Grobe in 2011 published an early phase two trial giving 0.2 milligrams of psilocybin to patients that had terminal cancer and showed a trend towards decreased depression and anxiety. And following up on this work, we have collaborated with Johns Hopkins and Roland Griffiths. This is our team here at NYU. And to get um, at the data, we recruited 29 individuals, mostly from our NYU Clinical Cancer Center. It was a nine month duration trial with single dose of psilocybin versus single dose of niacin in conjunction with psychotherapy. Uh, there was a crossover design at seven weeks. We initially included people that had terminal cancer, but we realized that people could have any stage of cancer and have enormous distress, so we included people, uh, even those who were in remission. We ruled out all the things that you would want to do from a medical, but in particular, psychiatric perspective. In particular, you want to rule out psychotic spectrum illness and family history of psychosis. Our primary outcome measure was anxiety and depression, but we also measured pain, spiritual measures, quality of life, and acceptance of disease process and death. The treatment was done essentially by the Stan Groff model at Spring Grove, two therapists, dyad team, uh, preparatory psychotherapy. We took a narrative of their life, narrative of cancer. We understood the distress of cancer. We prepared them carefully for the dosing sessions. And the very long uh, dosing sessions, they last uh, eight hours. It took an enormous regulatory burden to get approval for the trial. We had to get an IND from the FDA, schedule and license from the DEA. And it took a long time to do this, but there um, is a legal mechanism to do all of it. And so with enough persistence, it is possible to do this research. This is what our room looked like at NYU. So this is not a typical hospital looking room. It's very important to do it in this kind of a setting. So, we were able to, we pre-screened 108 individuals, we enrolled 42, we randomized 31, half to the placebo group and half to the psilocybin group. And you know, by the end, not everyone, we, uh, you know, we had patients that uh, unfortunately died, you know, these are cancer diagnoses. Unfortunately, I work at Bellevue Hospital and we really wanted to recruit from the Bellevue population, but we were unable to do so. So the demographic of this trial is essentially more women than men, essentially Caucasian, and about half were agnostic and had no sort of religious affiliation. The typical patient was a woman in her mid-50s that had metastatic gynecologic cancer at the NYU Clinical Cancer Center. We had, the majority did have advanced stage cancer, and about half had never done a hallucinogen. And this is what we found. In terms of adverse events, we know that psilocybin can increase blood pressure and pulse in a non-clinically relevant way, and that is what we found. We found uh, headaches and nausea. From a psychiatric perspective, there is a dark side to psychedelics, even when you can um, screen and um, take care of individuals. There is transient anxiety, and as um, Gabby mentioned earlier, the anxiety could actually be therapeutic. Uh, these were patients that had cancer, terminal cancer, that were facing death, and that had um, difficult encounters with cancer, and that actually ended up being therapeutic for, uh, for many of them. But 
Well, it's very important that there were no serious adverse events. There's been 2,000 doses of psilocybin administered in the U.S. and Europe in the last 15 years, and there have been zero serious adverse events. And so we can show that in clinical laboratory settings, psilocybin can be safely administered to participants. The crossover occurred at seven weeks, so the, the most scientifically valid part of this was the period of time before that. What comes next? We are, along with Hopkins and UCLA, about to present to the FDA this data, and we are trying to work with them to see if we're ready for a phase three trial. If they say that we are, then uh, there'll be a large phase three trial that includes several hundred participants. It's gonna take $30 million to do a trial like that, even though the federal government will give approval for these trials, uh, they have yet to give money for it. So it really um, requires venture philanthropists and private donors uh, to make this happen. It's gonna be a multi-site trial that will most certainly include uh, NYU, UCLA, and Johns Hopkins. Um, but there are gonna be many other sites. The New Yorker article, I don't know who read that, but it came out a couple months ago. And since that article, we've been contacted by at least um, over a dozen major medical centers, um, you know, places um, from the South to the Midwest, uh, all over the country. And it's been really remarkable to see the interest at these institutions. Uh, and so this project uh, took a long time. It sort of changed all of our lives. Um, and it's uh, deeply moving to work with the patients uh, in this trial. Um, and uh, helping them come, uh, you know, accept the, the process of being sick. Uh, medicine does a poor job of helping people who are dying, and what I really loved about this trial is it helped uh, all of us learn about uh, how to provide a good uh, death for our individuals uh, and how to think about death anxiety. So, thank you for your time. Dr. Gus, I'd like to bring you up here. When Tony Bossis and Steve Ross and I treated our first patient in the study, we were so shocked and surprised and thrilled and amazed that it was happening. Um, we were just trying to, to get all the work done. But even in the first uh, session, I realized that the data that was going to be generated was what the patients would write or the participants would write down. Um, and not, none, nothing that happened with the therapist was going into the uh, you know, permanent record of data. It was all clinical. And although we've changed it now in terms of, of really listening carefully to the subjective stories, and, and uh, we have a, a phenomenological study that uh, Alex Belser and, and Gabby uh, egan Liebes are doing, uh, there's really nothing quite like a first-hand narrative um, documentation. Yes, very much so. I still don't hurry. I make it a point to plan my life so I don't have to be in a hurry. I just, I don't have that kind of anxiety. I really don't. The thought might occur to me that, oh, this could be a recurrence, but I don't clutch up about it. I just feel, well, it could be, but probably not, and just keep going. Um, I've been really lucky, and, and I've been healthy all of this time. I can still go back to that state of feeling that incredible love and bliss that I felt during the experience. Sometimes I'll just listen to some of the music, and that will do it. Um, other times, just being, just a particular circumstance, and I will feel that again. So yes, it's enduring for me. In terms of needing, needing a drug to get to that place again, I don't feel like that's the case. Um, I can listen to the music, or even just uh, seeing that video today really brought me back to to what the experience was like and kind of reminded me of how, um, how live it is in me. Um, and I think that's one of the miraculous things about this study is that it was a, it was a one dose study. Uh, this wasn't a study that you go back you know, time and time again and have these experiences over and over again. It was a one dose study and um, I mean, here I am three years later talking about it as if it happened yesterday. So I think it, there really has been an enduring effect for it for me. I definitely have continued to search for meaning. I went to India and Nepal the following year, and to Spain, and last and this year to Africa. And I'm also a storyteller, so I have been talking about this on stage at, at a moth slam and different, wherever I can talk about it, because it was life-changing, and I would be open to doing another dosing, however. <laughs> it, it worked very well for a, a long time, and it changed me forever, but. I wouldn't, I, I'd be open to a second dose. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Well, the whole scheduling system was based on politics and not science. The two most damaging drugs of abuse, alcohol and tobacco, were absented from the Controlled Substance Act. The serotonergic hallucinogens like psilocybin and LSD, they really don't create addiction syndromes. By definition, Schedule 1 is of the highest addictive liability, no therapeutic utility. So the scheduling system is not really based on science, and unfortunately, the war on drugs uh, and the war against LSD led to the criminalization of addiction and it was very unfortunate for minority drug addicts. Um, but there's a long arc in the U.S. of the moralization of using drugs uh, versus the science. We've discovered all the science behind it, but in, a, in effect, the moralization has won over. So it, it may be frustrating, but um, science is the way to lead forward. And if the data shows that these drugs are, have potential therapeutic applicability, then it's working within the system to uh, see if there's enough of a signal. The phase three trial that I mentioned puts psilocybin, if, it, if the FDA allows us to move forward, it puts psilocybin on path to become scheduled from uh, one to something else uh, to become a prescribable uh, medication. And so we, we've treated about 80 individuals between UCLA, NYU, and Johns Hopkins. And that's a, a pretty good cohort. When we've treated two to 300 and we see that there's an effect um, you know, uh, psilocybin potentially will be rescheduled and, and will be prescribable, not to go get a pharmacy and take home, but to be used in specially designated psychedelic clinics by designated psychedelic therapists in very controlled, careful ways, similar to how we've done it in these studies. Some people said, um, I don't want people to know, I'm not interested in this, you know, being part of a public discourse on this, and it was a very private thing. So that would be stigma, right? But some people actually felt quite the opposite, and that speaking out, an opportunity to speak up and speak out was very important. And you know, many people said, I really want to say what I have to say uh, and have it be heard. I think it's really important, and uh, I want to raise my voice. My sure. parents and family just still doesn't talk about it. We don't talk about much, but I don't care. Because, <laughs> and that's one of the differences. I didn't want my employers knowing that I was part of this study. Um, also with my family, I remember the first time I told my family that I was involved in this study, they kind of raised an eyebrow like, well, what are you doing? Um, and my father's here today. So I mean, there's been a, well, and I think that kind of echoes the, the changes that are happening. And I think it does take people participating in these types of projects and then being vocal about it. And I think there's also maybe a, a generational difference between uh, my generation and maybe my parents' generation and generations in between that, you know, were associated with what happened after the, the, legal, or the Illegalization Act in 1970. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a lot of changes now just in the past couple years, and I feel really fortunate to, to be able to talk about it in an open way and to have people who are supportive of, of me and, and my involvement. I was careful. Uh, whom I told about it. At first, gradually, I started to tell a few more people. My family was very supportive. My daughters were way ahead of me. Um, <laughs> um, I, I um, did eventually tell anyone that I was close to, and I had no problems from it. And even at work, they know. Um, they knew I had cancer, so they knew that this was in conjunction with treatment for that. And I have not had a problem. And I feel incredibly lucky to have been in this trial. I, I mean, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> so, I mean, everybody knows what a difference it made in my life. And, but I also do believe that in a clinical setting with supervised, these amazing people that were taking care of me, I, I, it's just a personal matter. I mean, I just tell people how much it helped me and how it helped me, and it's up to them what they do with that information. Like some um, uh, practices like yoga or meditation, uh, I have a, uh, like a um, kind of background belief that a person needs to find their way to it on their own and have the desire and the interest, because I don't think psychedelics are for, e for everyone. Um, and the idea of taking a psychedelic is very frightening to, to many people, and I don't think that they should be encouraged to uh, ignore that fear because someone says that they think uh, they should. 
Um, so I think in general, finding your way or just hearing a little bit about it and then going for it and, and pursuing it is, is a better way for people to find their way. You know, I think there were, there were probably thousands of people that heard about our study that didn't take us up on it. But, you know, in the film, I saw it. I called that day. You know, there was like uh, uh, something that, that caught on internally. And I think that's really important part of it, rather than a doctor recommending it. Because it's not our medicine to, to recommend, except in, in this study. And so uh, I think you have to be careful as a physician how you use your, your power to say, you know, what is safe and what you've been trained to, uh, to administer and what you know about. And so we're just beginning to learn about how this medicine might be used in Western, Western medicine models and with Western medical patients who come to us for help. We're just sort of learning what this is going to look like um, in, in Western allopathic medical culture.